Welcome to the Therapy Show Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Mustard. In each episode, I interview a seasoned and knowledgeable talk therapist from the counseling world to glean valuable insights, techniques, and tools that you can apply to your practice and your life. And if you're considering a career in the counseling field or just want to hear about what it's like to be a talk therapist, then this is the podcast for you. Hey friends, welcome back to the podcast. I know it has been a hot minute since you have heard my voice on the show. It has just been a summer and a season for me and our family, and I'm just leaning into it (laughs) and recording episodes and taking time, putting out good content. So thanks for bearing with me as I took a little bit of time off there. So today's episode is kind of a little bit different. I interview my daughter, Emmy Mustard, first before we dive into the meat of the episode with Dr. Scott Cook. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Cook. He is a physician, a businessman, international lecturer who grew up in Pittsburgh, PA. He is a previous ER physician and shareholder partner in Med Express Urgent Care. Currently, Dr. Cook is medical director and chief medical officer at Recovery Centers of America, which is also called RCA, and Southwestern Pennsylvania Human Services. His current clinical work is in the areas of addiction medicine and behavioral health. Dr. Cook lectures on substance use disorders, mental health, avoiding professional burnout, one of my favorite topics, and creating world-class corporate cultures. He's an avid traveler, and he's visited more than 50 countries and has lectured in many of them. He is currently attending Harvard Medical School for a certificate in global health leadership. Plus, you guys, he has a book coming out soon and a podcast all about burnout, and you can connect with him over on LinkedIn. I heard Dr. Cook present for RCA Recovery Centers of America back in March, and he presented all about burnout. And you guys, I knew as soon as I heard and saw him speak, I had to have him as a guest on the podcast. Burnout is something that I've experienced. Oh, gosh many times over the past couple of years. And I know I've shared a little bit on the show what I've done to deal with burnout, but Dr. Cook is going to kind of get into the details or the weeds of what's going on with burnout and steps that you can take to overcome your burnout. So definitely give this episode a listen. And I encourage you to keep an eye on when his book comes out as well as his podcast. He has done tons of research. He's done tons of coaching. He even talks about his own burnout. So I'm excited to share him with y'all on this episode. But before we do that, here is my daughter, Emmy Jo Mustard, and I having a quick conversation about her finishing up fifth grade and her excitement for moving on into middle school. My hope is to interview my other daughter, who is older, if she will let me, in the next episode or two. So we hope you guys enjoy this episode. So can you please tell me your name and your age? I'm Emmy Jo Mustard, and I am 11 years old. Yes, you are. And how do we know each other? You're my mother. And what's it like for you to be interviewed by your mother on a podcast? Interesting. (laughs) How is it interesting? I don't know. It's just kind of weird, but like you're asking me these questions. I'm like, well, you know, you know the answer, but it's fun. Okay. So I know the answers, but people listening don't know the answer. So this is kind of like getting to know you. All right. So keep that in mind as, as I'm asking you questions. So what happened last week? That's a pretty big deal for you. Yeah, last week was the last week of school, and I got some awards, Mm -hmm. and I got really good grades. Yeah, and so what grade did you just finish? Fifth. Okay, and how do you feel about finishing? Because really, fifth grade is like the end of elementary school. How do you feel about kind of like that's the final chapter on elementary school? I'm excited for middle school. Yeah. 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 So what what are you most excited about for middle school? Mm, probably I get to do more stuff in middle school. So I'm excited for that and like get to learn new stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what, what stuff do you get to do in middle school that you couldn't do in elementary school? Well, I mean, next year they're going to take away being fifth grade is able to do sports. Mm-hmm. So it'll only be sixth grade through eighth. So I'm excited for next year. I'll be able to do the sports. Okay. And which sport are you most excited about? Volleyball and track. Yeah. Yeah. So that was kind of an interesting thing. A a lot of interesting things happened for our family over COVID, but one of the most interesting things that happened for us was that you went from a public school to a small private school that only goes up to eighth grade. Well, it goes to middle school, or not, it goes to high school, but it's online. Well, right. The the high school program is is not really an in-person program. They do a combination online program. 
And we never thought, daddy and I never thought that we would have kids in, in private school. So when daddy and I made the decision for you to go, it's kind of a spontaneous thing. What was that decision like for you to leave public school and go to a new school, to a private school? Well, I was excited because I've always wanted to go to private school, but I mean, I didn't have any friends, but I had Harper. So, I mean, I was excited because I knew somebody and I, I make new friends, but yeah, I've always wanted to go to a private school. Oh, really? Okay. So private school, we've always been a little bit excited about the idea of, of going to private school. Okay. Compared to public school, how was it a different experience for you? What was the main difference? between the private school and the public school that you noticed this year in fifth grade? Well, there were a lot of differences because like fifth graders at we couldn't do any sports, but this year we can. Mm -hmm. And this year, I feel like we're learning more stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, because also at public school, we didn't have grammar, but at private school, we do. So. Okay. So the, the addition of being able to play sports mm -hmm. in fifth grade was exciting. And then learning grammar which I, go, I know was difficult at first because you'd never really had been taught grammar, like you've been taught vocabulary and uh, language arts, but grammar hadn't really been a thing. I mean, it was for me when I was a kid and I remember in middle school doing a lot of grammar. So I was really glad that you guys got grammar. Okay. So Emmy, can you tell me a little bit about your teacher? Miss Clark or the other teachers? Well, Miss Clark, oh, I mean, but well, you can talk about the other ones too. Miss Clark was really fun. She did a lot of stuff for us and she spent a lot of time on it. Mm -hmm. And he just made things more interesting for us. It was really fun. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that. It was it was a very different environment. Different, not saying it was, you know, any bit better or worse than where you came from, but just very different. Like, things were just very different at this school, right? Okay, what about your other teachers? Well, like they were also really fun because they got to do stuff for us and they made it more interesting. And they just, I don't know, it's just it teachers, but they made it more interesting for us. So it was more fun. And then tell me about the class trip that you guys took in earlier in the year. We went to Camp Leopold and we spent one night there and we went canoeing and Harper fell out of the boat. <laughs> It's really funny. It was really fun. I'm yeah. glad because at public school, we weren't like we never went on those trips. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, in fifth grade, we would have. But mm -hmm. at this school, we like go on more trips. Yeah. 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 OK, cool. I'm trying to think of other highlights that you had this year that were really different and new and exciting compared to, you know, maybe we had the spring fair mm -hmm. and because it we had the spring picnic, mm -hmm. but we had the spring fair and there are like games and rides mm -hmm. and it's, I think it was more fun in my opinion, but yeah. the spring picnic was also fun. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's different, but similar, you know, a similar idea. And so middle school has its own set of new challenges because we're fifth grade. You were kind of like the big kid on the block. Now you're going to be like the little, the little fish in a bigger pool. How does that, how does that feel? Well, I'm really I mean, I'm friends with most of the sixth graders and seventh graders because Eva was there and I did a bunch of sports and they did it. So I'm friends with a bunch of them. So it will just be like I'm going up into a new grade, but I'll have more friends because I'll be closer to them. Right. I gotcha. Because you have some friends that are right now that are moving up into seventh grade and you'll be in sixth grade. So you guys will be together and see each other more. So I know you're excited about that and being able to hopefully play on the volleyball team with some of those girls. That'll be a lot of fun. Okay. So what about this summer? What are you most looking forward to for this summer? Probably just hanging out with my friends and I'm excited for camps and volleyball. Mm -hmm. And I just happy for the break because we don't have to get up and go to sleep at like seven. So we don't have to get up at like six. So mm -hmm. I'm very excited for that. Yeah. You get to sleep in a little bit. You know what I'm excited about? Not having to take us to school? No, more than that. To do all that work, no, not having to make lunches. Yes, not having to make lunches because this is the summer that you and your sister learn how to make lunches yeah. on your own. So what I know, and I've been like preaching this for years, like what goes into a healthy lunch? What are the what are the requirements for a healthy lunch coming from me and Daddy? Well, it has to have vegetables and it has to have some like fiber, like meat in it or something, or like protein or something, and something that's filling and not a bunch of like junk food mm -hmm. and, fruit like, yeah fruit fruit it's good too. healthy carbs healthy carbs yeah that too <laughs> but of course oops but of course still being able to enjoy the fun stuff like oh yeah like twinkies and ding dongs <laughs> <laughs> yeah that time i bought a box of twinkies and ding dongs at sam's club and heard about that from billy for weeks <laughs> 
<laughs> and pop tarts too. We like pop tarts. Yeah. So a little bit of the fun stuff, but mainly the healthy stuff. Okay. And so far, what's been your favorite movie of the summer? Because you've seen two. So Top Gun. Top Gun. <laughs> yes. Well, the, both of them, but if I had to choose one, I'd choose the first one. Oh, really? Yeah. That's interesting because, you know, the Top Gun came out when I was 13. So, which is your sister's age. And I remember I told you guys this, like going to the theater and seeing it at least 30 times in the theater. And I think that movie came out, I think it came out in the summer also, if I recall correctly. It's kind of weird. Like here I am as a mom taking my kids to a movie that I saw when I was your age. That's wild. And Tom Cruise looks the same. (laughs) I don't know what he's eating or drinking, but he's got the money to make himself look really good. But if you guys haven't seen Top Gun Maverick, we give it, I guess, four thumbs up because we each gave it a thumb up, thumbs up. Yeah. And then we saw, of course, what other movie? Downton Abbey. Yeah. Downton Abbey. We, we have a that was thing. good too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just like the show better. Yeah. The show. Yeah. You, if you love the show, we highly recommend seeing the movie and I won't give you any spoilers. Don't worry. Just go see it. Go see it. Well, this has been a really fun interview. Who do you hope listens to this interview? Uh, people that I do not know. I don't, I don't want people that I know to hear this to be like, ah, you are your Rob's interviews. But I mean, I'd like some people to know that I was on it because it'd be cool. Okay, so we'll send it to grandmas and extended family and your friends. So most of my listeners are therapists like me. So what do you think they should know about 11-year-old girls? What What is important for them to know? Mm, I do not know. Nothing? You can't think of anything? Not really, no. Would you give them any advice on how to talk to an 11-year-old girl? Uh, I'm different from most girls because I'm special, but <laughs> I don't know. Maybe something that you and I have talked about is maybe ask about what they're interested in. Yeah. Okay. I mean, what hobbies do they do? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who are their, what are their favorite books? Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Favorite TV shows? Anything else? What games they like to play? Like what video games? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if somebody asks you, What's your favorite book? What would you say? Uh, the Hunger Games. Ooh. Oh, I did not see that coming. I thought you'd say the the one that you, you've read like a gazillion yeah, time. Yeah. Um, the Land of Stories. That's also really good. Yeah, and I like the series that I'm reading right now. Exactly. Oh, School for Good and Evil. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You also like, did you read The Hobbit? I don't remember. I'm going to read that this summer. Okay. That, oh, and then you have a bunch of books for, for school that you've got to read this summer. So yeah, just two. Okay. Well, you want to ask me any questions while I got you here? Mm. Why did you want to interview me? Oh, that's a really good question. Because, well, I'll tell you why. Because you're very special to me. You are part of my why as to why I do things and go out and I work and um, have the life that daddy and I have created is because family is first and you are that family, family first. And I think I get asked a lot of questions about my kids and who are they and what what do they do? What are they like? Because I don't put you guys on social media like a lot of people do, you know, where people kind of get a sense for who their kids are and what they're interested in. And that was just something that, you know, I've said this for a long time that daddy and I said from the beginning when it came to social media that we wouldn't put your faces out there until you guys were ready to want to even use social media. And, um, so I thought doing a podcast, it's your voice. They get to know you, they get to hear you. I mean, they don't really see you, but when you're older and you're ready to have your face out there, then I will reconsider (laughs) putting you guys up there. But until then, I just thought this was a nice way to share you with my listeners and with our family a little bit. So yeah, that's why you have any other questions for me? Mm, Could you make chili for dinner today? Oh, (laughs) (laughs) I, I had a feeling it would be about food. No, we're having um, we're having pot roast tonight, but I will make chili at some point this week. How about that? Is that a deal? Okay. Well, thanks, Emmy, for being here. It's been a great time interviewing you. Um, where can people get to know? No, that's what I usually say. Where can people find you? You can find her at home this summer at volleyball. Oh, and you have your piano and bass recital coming up. So that's pretty cool. So you'll find her playing music and hanging out with her friends and touching the volleyball as much as possible. What else? May, oh, bake sale. You and your friend are going to, you and Sophie are going to have a bake sale. So if they're local to us, then maybe they'll want to come and support your bake sale. So I'll keep everybody posted on when and where that's going to be. Sound good? Okay. Well, thanks, Emmy Joe, for being here. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Therapy Show. I am your host, Lisa Mustard, and this week's guest is Dr. Scott Cook. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Hey, I really appreciate you having me. 
Yeah. So I got to share, um, heard you, saw you on a continuing education course back in March on burnout. And I think honestly, that's probably the best, the best CEO education I have seen heard on burnout. And I just knew that I had to have you on the show. So here we are. I'm so glad we can make this happen. Hey, I really appreciate the positive feedback. Yeah, it is. Could you go ahead and share a little bit about who you are and what you do today? Sure, absolutely. I'm a physician uh, first and foremost, and I've practiced medicine for about 20 years or so, a little bit more than 20 years. And I've gone through various stages in my career. I've worked in about 10 different areas of medicine. So I have a lot of experience seeing patients pretty much in every spectrum you can imagine. And at one point in my career, when I was working in the emergency department, I got extremely burned out and uh, had to figure a way to make a professional pivot and try to heal from Mm -hmm. professional burnout. And through all my patient experiences and professional experiences, I was able to figure out a unique way that people could start to sort of examine, diagnose, and treat burnout, and really ultimately prevent burnout. Because at the end of the day, you know, job health maintenance and burnout prevention is more important than treating it once it happens. So from a professional standpoint, I went through this personally, and I really just wanted to come up with some ways to share my story and help people because I really feel a lot of people are feeling the same thing. It's kind of like mental health and the stigma that's been associated with mental health for many years. And maybe people don't don't want to talk about it. So I thought it would be a way to kind of, uh, you know, pull the covers back, so to speak, and expose it as a problem that's very common. Right, right. Can you go into a little bit about how you recognize you were in burnout when you were in emergency medicine? I think one of the first things that most people notice, and certainly I noticed, was a change in personality. So if you're a very nice person, all of a sudden you find yourself being short with people or maybe being what could be perceived as mean. That's a sign there's probably something wrong when your true personality actually changes. And it's something I noticed in myself and colleagues noticed. And, you know, when you get this negative feedback, you have to be open to it. And my family noticed. Uh, So I think change in personality is number one. Number two would be emotional sadness, anxiety or uh, extreme fatigue. Mm -hmm. So I have a joke and I told this in our uh, CEU session that not a joke. It was a real life situation. But I would find myself on vacation going to great exotic places to get away from the ER. But I would just sort of stay in the room and, and just sleep for seven days. And so I really wasn't living. I was just sort of existing to work and rest. And that's not really uh, a balanced life. Wow. That's really interesting that you noticed that about, you know, the process of what you were going through. Huh? Okay. Did your family, like, what were they, what did they say about the, about that at the time? Do you remember? Yeah. I think family and friends just sort of noticed this cycle of work and rest and really Mm -hmm. nothing in between. And people might notice that you're more on edge and you get these questions like, do you really like what you do? Because when you're at work and you come home, you seem frustrated And I really think the hard part is being open to constructive criticism. I think it's the same thing that happens in the workplace. Some people you might have worked with, maybe they're not people who take constructive criticism well, but if it comes from a place of love. And so that's an important sort of line of demarcation. Family members, friends, people you know, love you. When they have these observations, you kind of have to be open to it because they have no motivation other than your well-being. So you really have to open yourself up to it. But it's hard to do having, uh, you know, a self-reflection mirror. It, right. it's tough. it is. It is. And I know in the presentation that you did for us back in March, you shared a number of, you know, some research, some steps to overcome burnout. I mean, there's so much we could, we could talk about when it comes to burnout on this episode. Sure. What do you feel like, you know, being that I am, well, let me back up. You are now, uh, you're a psychiatrist. Is that right? Addiction medicine? I work in addiction medicine and behavioral health. So I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm a family doctor by training, but I've done emergency medicine, uh, behavioral health and addiction medicine. Okay. So how did you decide to pivot into um, addiction medicine? Well, the cool thing is, I think it was sort of luck, so to speak. So when I finished my residency, it was in family medicine. I realized about halfway through, I really didn't want to do family medicine, quite honestly. But you're in your second year of three years and you're kind of stuck. One thing we had the opportunity to do as residents was do some moonlighting. So I did moonlighting in the emergency department 
where I was taught by emergency physicians and I did uh, addiction medicine moonlighting. And then once I finished my residency, I pretty much went into emergency medicine full time and addiction medicine part time. And I always loved that addiction medicine component. Mm -hmm. Uh, I always loved going. I always loved it while I was there. And when I left, it wasn't like a sense of relief. It was just like, oh, my my day's done. So I really enjoyed it more than the ER. And so that's kind of how I got into it. And as time went on, I sort of increased my addiction medicine work and decreased my ER work and, and eventually exited uh, okay. emergency medicine. OK, gotcha. So what I'm hearing is that you you just were more interested and more passionate about addiction medicine and you you decided to make that switch from emergency medicine to addiction medicine. Was that a hard thing to I guess my question is. Did you feel any kind of guilt or shame about, you know, being so, so much in the emergency medicine world? Like you put so much time and energy into learning that craft and that space. And then over here, you're enjoying addiction medicine. Was there a difference for you? And like, Mm -hmm. I'm just curious to know more about that, like how you made that that change. Sure. It took some courage because really at the time, if you think back 20 years ago, addiction medicine was not seen as a great field. Gotcha. It wasn't seen as great in society. So society had the stigma about people who suffered from substance use disorders. Certainly physicians spoke very poorly of the patients, unfortunately, and the profession. And so it took some courage. But I really started to believe and understand that if you seek a career that is something you're passionate about and you have compassion, you'll end up being happy. And so I kind of stepped out on a limb. And now addiction medicine is very well received. There's work everywhere. There's grant funding. There's a real push to treat these patients. And sort of uh, I luckily was ahead of the curve. So that's one of the take home messages. Right. Pursue careers of passion and everything else will, so, will sort of work out. Oh, you know, my husband just said that to me the other day. So I'm hearing it from him. I'm hearing it from mm-hmm. you. <laughs> need to pay attention to that for sure. Yeah, it's so true. Uh, Passion is one thing that typically people maybe put on the back burner because often careers of passion maybe aren't financially rewarding as other careers. But what one thing I've learned is if you learn to pursue passion and not money, that's one of the chapters in a book I have coming out. In the end, you'll make more money because Mm -hmm. you're going to be better at a passionate job. You're going to do better performance wise. And as time goes on, you'll end up doing better uh, financially. So it's really a counterintuitive thing, but it it really is the way I think we should think about careers. Yeah, I like that. I like that um, advice. I think that, you know, if you're a young therapist listening to this episode and you're still in grad school, I mean, pay pay attention because this is some life experience and some wisdom that, that is being given today. So I'm, I'm really grateful that you're sharing not just, you know, the burnout aspect of, of what we do, but in the process and how to get over burnout, but just like this idea that it's not like something that's to, to fix the burnout, possibly mm-hmm. you have to really reach, you have to shift and you have to pivot. Absolutely. And I think maybe that's kind of hard sometimes for folks who have been who are so invested in what they do and their credentials and mm-hmm. their, um, their titles and the money they make. And mm-hmm. I think that keeps a lot of people stuck and staying in the burnout. And one of the slides that you put up, I was just reviewing them earlier is talking about where burnout happens most often. And it looks like it's between like, 35 and 55. Is that about right? Correct. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So early in our careers, we're motivated. You're excited. You can't wait to get into your profession Mm -hmm. as a doctor, a dentist, a therapist, a business person, attorney, teacher. But then the realities of the job really set in and it's kind of a mid-career thing. And hopefully people can identify it and pivot so they can have a happy post-career. So most patients have a great patients, meaning uh, people, Mm because I look at people who are suffering from this as professional patients. But most individuals have a very happy early career and late career if they can pivot. But the middle is really where it where it becomes tough. Right. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. So I know in you have a book coming out soon. Is that right? I do. I have an adult book and a children's book coming out, but the adult book focuses on burnout prevention and how to make professional pivots and and find job happiness. Okay. Well, I definitely can't wait to read that, but if you could give us a little bit of a sneak peek into maybe what are some ideas or what are some ways that we can combat when we realize that we're dealing with burnout, like what are some steps we should take? Yeah, I think the main thing is being able to do an assessment of where you are. So the title of the book is The Prescription to Heal Your Career. And the subtitle is it's a treatment plan for individuals and organizations. 
So organizations have to create welcoming world-class corporate cultures, but individuals have to be happy in what they do. And so the book is written in a unique way where there's kind of five different components that I use to sort of tell stories. And there are parallels that are pretty striking. So component one is just my life story. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, when I really wanted to write a book, I wanted to tell my life story, but that alone would be pretty boring. So I pulled out the most salient, important things that happened in my life that were transformational. Step two or component two is I really wanted it to be not just a book, but a brain exercise. So if you remember from our talk, there are multiple brain exercises in the book where people who read the book actually will help write the book. And that's hard to kind of convey because the book's already written, but I don't want to give too much away, but mm -hmm. there are things that the reader is, is asked to do that'll help determine the outcome of the book. So that's part two. Mm -hmm. uh, component three is I develop some unique characters. So there are what I call character archetypes you meet at work. You might notice some of these uh, personalities in yourself or other people. And understanding how characters interact in the workplace is important. The fourth component is using the human body as a way to demonstrate what can happen in careers. So the human body is really what I call the most efficient and exquisite corporation ever created. It's multiple units working together and you find some of the same diseases in the body. These, these sicknesses happen in companies. And then lastly, I use poems and hip hop lyrics to kind of tie all, all these things together. So it's five separate components, but like a rope, they're intertwined to make a really tight story. And so if people read this, I think they will get the ideas, but it basically is a way to teach and retrain your brain in terms of how you think about your career and how you should go forward. And it'll help people, I think, become much more successful if they follow these principles. This episode of The Therapy Show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Are you experiencing anxiety, struggling with symptoms of depression, having trouble sleeping, or perhaps you're dealing with relationship issues? If this sounds like you, consider checking out BetterHelp. BetterHelp provides affordable private online counseling and will match you with a professional licensed therapist. And you can get therapy in four different ways. You can exchange messages with your therapist. You can chat live. You can speak over the phone and you can even video conference with your therapist. And you can use different ways at different times as you wish based on your needs, availability and convenience. BetterHelp's licensed therapists specialize in a wide range of issues, including anxiety, trauma, relationship issues, stress, depression, and much, much more. So join over the 2 million people who've decided to get help and get happy with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com forward slash Lisa Mustard and get started today with 10% off your first month. Great. And you also have a podcast coming out. Is that correct? I do. And it's it's really, it's complimentary to the book. It's the exact same uh, concept. So the podcast is called the Coat and Scope Podcast, a shout out to the Lab Coat and Stethoscope of Physicians. But it really is a podcast to help people also see uh, other professionals who have had tremendous success, but have really overcome lots of obstacles. And I approach it from the professional who's being interviewed, being a professional patient. And we kind of go through a history the same way a doctor would examine a patient and come up with a conclusion at the end. And it, it really should be fun. I think people will really get a lot out of it. Yeah. Oh, it sounds like a really interesting format. When will that be ready to launch? First episode of the podcast will be the first week of July and the book comes out uh, Tuesday, August 16th. Oh, great. Okay. Well, I can't wait to, to listen to that and I'll, I'll learn a good bit, I'm sure. And you know, the reason I'm so curious about burnout, I've had a couple of folks on the show in the past who've talked about burnout, but it's it's just so common I'm finding as a therapist, counselors, especially mm -hmm. the past couple of years of COVID, just Oh my gosh, I could, you know, you and I could probably go on and on about all the things that we've had to endure and uh, restructure and just all kinds of things. And it can be very overwhelming. And I talk to a lot of peers who are thinking, is this, do I want to keep doing this work? You right. know, how do I, how do I stay in the game? How do I keep it going if it's something that I want to stick with? And I remember in your presentation, one of the things that you mentioned is you may have to switch your job. You may have right. to find something different. So I'm, I'm curious, have you come across any therapists as professional patients that you've worked with? And, and maybe you could share some insights from working with them. 
Yeah, many. Even last week I had two. I do some uh, career coaching Mm -hmm. and I had two therapists last week that I met with for an hour and sort of helped them work through some issues. But there are like five warning signs that Mm -hmm. maybe you need to think differently and make a pivot. So the first one is if you wake up and you absolutely dread the thought of going to work, that's like the first sign or symptom that there's probably a major issue. Mm -hmm. Then if you commute to work or work at home as you're driving or as you're about to log on, you have like extreme anxiety about your work day. And then once you physically arrive or you physically start working, uh, extreme sense of sadness overcomes you. Mm -hmm. And during your day, if you cannot wait for it to end, that's kind of point four. And then lastly, once your day is over, if you know your anxiety decreases and your mood increases, Those are kind of five things that really make you think it's probably time to do something else. I think the decision tree comes in to where is there a way to pivot within your role? That's Mm -hmm. the first thing. And if the answer is yes, you should really try to do that. But if the answer really is no, it probably is really time to, to, to look elsewhere. Okay. That's some great, great feedback. And I think when I heard you say that the first time I was like, I need to switch. Like it it was so clear in my mind. I mean, I think Mm -hmm. fight fighting those feelings more than anything is harder than accepting. Like, no, sometimes you just need to switch and pivot and do something different and try something new. And I just, this resonates for me on a lot of levels. So thank you. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you for helping me. (laughs) No, it's so true. I've I've, I've had to use it myself. And Mm -hmm. I think the main thing is the fear of change. Yeah. And I've noticed that. So actually I was meeting with a nurse two weeks ago who it was so clear that her situation was sort of uh, irretrievably broken Mm -hmm. and there was nowhere to pivot. The other thing you look at is the, is there a person at your job making you miserable? And if it's your boss, is that person leaving? Mm -hmm. And if they're going to be there 20 years and they're beloved and you have nowhere to go, it's so obvious you have no choice. But when I was meeting with her, she sort of said, well, I'm going to try again. And, but she like literally is crying during the session. And she said, she's cried every day for the past month. And so, you know, people have to come to their own conclusions, but it was like crystal clear to me, like there's no other option. And then I think the other thing is, you know, I asked the question, have you ever had a job outside of this field of nursing? I already knew the answer. The answer was no. So there are sort of two types of people. There are people who migrate and there are people who don't migrate. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the longest air migration, it's the uh, Arctic turn, several thousand miles a year. And the longest land migration is the Great Caribou, over a thousand miles a year. Then there are resident birds, And these birds, like a resident in a hospital, they don't ever leave the nest or certainly they don't stray far from the nest. And what I was trying to get her to see is she's probably a resident bird mentality, but maybe she needs to think about migration. Me, I've always been a caribou or an Arctic tern. I will leave in a minute and I will move across country like it just doesn't bother me. But people have personality types that that's who they are. But you have to start to think a little bit outside the box and deal with reality. Yeah, I really like that. That's a great way of putting it. I really like that because I know a lot of folks out there, they want to be pliable. They want to have a growth mindset. They want to, they want to, you know, they say they'll do all those things, but when it comes Mm -hmm. down to it, they, you know, no, I'm going to stay where I am. (laughs) I'm going to be miserable, but it's almost like they're carrying this cross or something, or they're trying to be like a martyr and stay and stay and stay when really the only, I mean, they're hurting themselves really more than anybody and those who love them because they have to, you know, deal and put up with, with what's going on for that family member. That's really difficult. It is, Lisa. You hit the nail on the head in that there's a couple of things that I think happen. Number one, you really can't change your personality type. So if you're a person who is stuck in fear and you don't like change, you really can't change that. And I wouldn't expect you to. But just trying to make a couple clicks of change, that's important. And then you brought up this weight. You know, I always say that burnout is like an invisible backpack. And just think of that imagery. You know, it's nobody else can see it, but it's adding weight to your shoulders. You're carrying this around. And so you have to find a way to kind of unload it. So, right. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if we've, I know you and I've chit chatted or discussed things on email, but I'm not sure if I told you a little bit about my story and one of the ways that I cope with 
my burnout is by starting this podcast. You know, having this podcast has been such a creative outlet for me because it was something that I missed in my job, you know, having a creative outlet where I, I show up, I do what I do. I, for the most part, you know, enjoy who I work with and who I support. But there are some days when the, uh, the tempo is really high, the expectations are high. And that's when my burnout starts to kick in. Mm. And so I realized a couple of years ago that to keep that at bay, to have, you know, because my brain was just getting just like so much space for the, what was going on in the moment. Um, I had to set better boundaries with, with that, with work and also Mm -hmm. have a creative outlet. That's my personality, you know, it's like, I needed, Mm -hmm. I needed something creative to do. And starting this podcast has really been a way that I handle it, you know, that I can channel some energy into something different. I mean, I still have my days when I'm like, what am I doing? (laughs) Do I still want to stay here? But it helps me get through it. You know, that so. is so fantastic. Yeah. You know, one thing I say in the book is the best way to make yourself a better professional is to develop hobbies or side hustles kind mm-hmm. of outside of your work. Mm-hmm. And it'll make you a better professional and make you be able to practice your profession with passion and compassion. And for me, you know, my my hobby is travel. Mm-hmm. So whereas when I was in the ER, I would travel, but not really do much, just sort of sit in the room. You know, I've traveled to multiple countries and that's my outlet. And now because I'm no longer burned out. I'm out doing things and excursions and having fun. And so meeting people from all over is really like what I enjoy. So kudos to you for identifying that and and creating the podcast. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. I was, I think it's really cool that you travel and that's like your, your outlet, you know, that, that that's where, so where are you located? Cause I know like, where do you live? So I live part-time in Western Pennsylvania. So I grew up in Pittsburgh and we have a house in Amelia Island, Florida, which is Northern Florida, small, nice community. So I'm sort of part-time in both places. Okay. And so when you have full-time position with a, with Recovery Center of America, is that right? Yeah, I'm their medical director. And then I'm also a chief medical officer of an outpatient multi-location behavioral health and addiction medicine center in Western Pennsylvania. It's the third largest nonprofit in Western PA. So I do some inpatient stuff at Recovery Centers of America and an outpatient work uh, with the other organization. And it really provides me to have a really full, you know, full career. But then, uh, so your podcast and your book are separate though. That's like your, correct something else that you, you created and established and came up with. I think that's really neat. Yeah, it's been fun. It took me eight years to write the book. And, you know, quite honestly, if anyone's ever thinking of doing it really is something you should do. It's interesting, though, like the first seven books that I tried to write were just terrible, quite honestly. And I just thought this isn't good. I mean, you have to be honest. But then, you know, when I got goosebumps, when I came up with this idea, that's something you can't fake. And I knew it was at least a good idea, but it it did take a long time. But it was very cathartic to write it, quite Mm -hmm. honestly, and just something else that helped me identify burnout by writing the book. Right. Yeah. So the the first seven books, were they in this topic at all or something different? I'm just curious. Different topics. Like yeah. I had one idea that I was going to have a book like called sort of rules of the road to navigate your career. Similar yeah. idea. And I would use things like merge and caution and speed limits, like yeah. metaphors about driving that relate to your career. And then I, I kind of Googled it and somebody already had that yeah. idea and wrote the book. So I'm like, OK, that's out. And then I had different ideas about books, uh, relationship book. And then I realized all my relationships failed until I met my wife. So I really wasn't a relationship expert. Like you have to be honest. And so I had a couple other ideas, but they just, I just didn't feel the drive and and I would read it and it was sort of, eh, it was average. And so I kind of scrapped the ideas, but I finally came up with something that I think really fit me personality wise. Definitely. So how do you, how do you schedule your day? How do you have time for all these things with, with all you do? I'm just curious. I'm wondering about that. You know, what's so funny. This is the reason I wrote the book. The number one question I have gotten from physicians and other people is how are you doing all this stuff? And it's kind of like anything else when you're doing it, you're just doing it. But I think me finally being happy professionally has given me energy where it's, I figured out a way to multitask and I really love what I do. And it's like, it's not work. And so that was one reason I decided to to write, because that was the one question I kept getting, like, how did you actually do all this? And I really put everything I did into that book and I didn't leave anything out, but it really comes from just being happy. Oh, okay. So that's a lot to think about. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I need to read your book. (laughs) I'm telling you, I really think, you know, I have a money back guarantee to be funny. And I I really mean it that if anybody reads it 
and they read every word and do every brain exercise. And at the end, they don't feel that they're a better human being or better equipped to tackle their career challenges. I will refund their money, including the shipping, if they send the book back, because I would be very surprised if people read it and they're open to it and they actually read it all and do all the, the work that they wouldn't get a lot out of it. And the beauty is it really only takes about two or three hours to read. So it's a short book, but, but pretty powerful. Wonderful. Okay. Well, I can't wait for it to come out and I can't wait to listen to your podcast and, and I'm going to, I would like a signed copy. So I'll be sending you my book. So yeah, for you Ab- to sign absolutely. It. It's no problem. <laughs> awesome. Well, is there anything else that um, I didn't ask that I should have? I just, I love what you're doing and I'm just so grateful that you're out there doing this work. No, likewise. I really enjoyed the time uh, sharing with you and I'll be doing some more, some more talks. So we'll keep each other posted professionally, but it's been really wonderful to be on with you. Oh my gosh. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys, before we end this episode, if you are liking my content, if you're liking my podcast, be sure to go over and leave me a five-star review on the podcast platform of your choice. And if you are up for it, I'd love it if you left me a review as well. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Therapy Show with Lisa Mustard. I know there are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and I'm thankful you've chosen to listen to mine. Be sure to visit lisamustard.com to access the show notes and discover more fantastic content. And I'd be grateful if you subscribe to the show. Thank Thank you. you.